build that internal fortitude of courage that it outweighs, it just blasts through that whole timid thing, you know, where success and failure, it doesn't matter. It's the fact that you are putting yourself out there to be successful or fail. Okay, so for this interview, I have the pleasure of speaking with Stephanie Goldman, who is a uh, an entity in her own right, a very prolific artist, because she can basically take on any medium, any subject, um, president of the National Watercolour Society, so she knows a lot about exhibitions, competitions, um, things probably that have worked, things that don't work, and I thought that it would be a discussion. We could have a discussion that would be eye-opening for a lot of people. So welcome, Stephanie. Thank you very much, Janine. I'm honored to be asked to have this discussion with you. I think there's a lot to talk about when it comes to watercolor and water media and what's happening in the world. What's on your radar? You're in the middle of um, organizing the 103rd um, exhibition for the National Watercolor Society. You're probably up to here with organization, but as a professional artist, how can you handle such a big responsibility and juggling so many different roles? Well, that's a good question. I think because um, I take what I well, I take being president very seriously. I've served on the board since 2015, so I know a lot about the organization. I have a fantastic board. They are practically self-starters, so they handle a lot all on their own. And I think that's key to a good organization. Um, my own work, yes. Am I doing as much of my own work as I was before? No, but um, I still maintain my art, my studio time. I'm working on a big commission right now and I'm still entering shows. I'm jury. I'm juried up quite a few shows this year already, which I totally love doing. I've been accepted into shows and rejected into shows. So as a professional artist, I think it's important to experience all of it. And I, I feel I bring that compassion and that knowledge um, to whatever it is that I'm doing. Yeah. What do you think it gives you? Um, as an artist, because I know this from myself, judging taught me so much. Um, has it taught you a lot, judging um, other people's paintings? A ton, a ton, because I think as an artist, you know, we can totally empathize when somebody, when you have to not include some, you don't pick somebody's painting for whatever reason. And it may be either because you ran out of space or it doesn't fit with the whole look of the show. And it has nothing to do with whether or not it's a fantastic piece. It just doesn't go well with the look of the show. Um, some, some shows they put parameters on, and so they maybe don't let you include pieces that you might want to include. But I know um, in terms of judging, I think it really sharpens your senses in terms of what to look for. And what little thing maybe give that painting, you know, if you have two paintings that are both on every metric, they're amazing, they all score the highest possible level, but then there's just one little thing that moves one further than the other. It could be an emotional moment, and if you're juring in person, it could be presentation. And, and I think artists need to really consider that if they're, if they're entering a show where the piece is being juried live, presentation can make all the difference. So you want your presentation to be absolutely perfect. The frame's perfect. The matting's perfect. So that, you know, that if that's the bottom line criteria for a juror, between you and somebody else, they're going to pick you because maybe that other person didn't have a, you know, really well cut mat, or maybe their frame was scuffed up or the corners weren't totally right. You know, it, it makes it matters. Yeah, completely. And it's completely overlooked by most totally. artists. Yeah, they'll go to the, the cheapest 
um, because it's it's an expensive thing uh, to frame. So a lot of people will cut corners on the presentation, yet the presentation is basically presenting your painting. It's not a place to cut corners. No, yeah. it's not a place to cut corners. And especially, you know, if you've spent money to enter, you're spending money to ship, you're spending money to frame, and you may get an award. And if you're wanting to sell your painting, boy, you know, that is another thing. A lot of artists, they don't really take into consideration in a juried show where it's not all just your work, you're showing with 90 other people or, you know, 100 other people or 50 other, you have to play well or look well with your neighbors. So that means a very simple, elegant framing, which oftentimes is less expensive than what a lot of artists pick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So in America, it works so differently from in other countries because um, you have these watercolor societies. Um, there's a lot of watercolor societies which have been around for a long time. Um, in Europe, we don't have that. We have um, watercolor shows, but you know some of them have only been up and running for two years, maybe five years, maybe the longest is about ten years, and um, everybody is um, basically doing sort of charity work. And if you like, no one's paid for anything, and so they don't sort of stick around for a long time. They don't. Um, there doesn't seem to be a structure where people can pass the organization down from one person to another person. Um, in America, it, it's very different. Your your actual infrastructure for the watercolor scene um, is really probably the envy of every world, every every other country. Um, is there a place for lots of competitions and exhibitions? Does it get stretched? Um, do are there more and more artists because of it, or or is it basically the same artists exhibiting in in the same places? Well, actually, I think it's all of the above that you just mentioned, because I I noticed, you know, in, in many, many shows, there are some artists that I see, they, they enter everything. I think they have, enter their work into every watercolor show out there. And um, which, you know, it's excellent because it's continually, and, and they're always getting in. And so there's a level of excellence that is, a vil that's visible for every artist to see and and it's like okay why did that why do they always get in why is their work always chosen and there's so much to learn from that i know some artists are like oh their work is always picked well okay you know well let's let's break it down let's have a look let's see what they're doing you know let's find out if email the person, find out, do they teach? Can, do, you know, are they open for a conversation? But the other thing you mentioned has to do with volunteering. And you're really right about America and volunteering. I think it is a part of the infrastructure of Americans to volunteer. Now, having said that, are we having problems? Is is all are all organizations suffering from volunteers new young people coming in to volunteer absolutely everybody i talk to is saying you know we we're, we're working to bring in young people we want to get them off of their screens and into making art and you know we want volunteers we are lucky the nws is lucky 103 years old that totally volunteer based organization always has owned and operated run by artists and it it you know that's really something especially because artists have purchased a building they bought a building and now the organization owns that building in Los Angeles it's in San Pedro I, you know, that is amazing for artists to continue to contribute to an organization, step up and volunteer, dump their time, treasure, and talent in, into a service for however many years they serve and have it be rewarding. Be, you know, it's rewarding. And they, if you talk to anybody who's served on the board, no matter what catastrophe may have occurred, 
I think at the end of the day, they will say it was a rewarding experience. They learned a lot and they're glad they did it. Yeah, I find it amazing. I find it inspiring. I, I really do find that the American system is brilliant, but the NWS is is sort of, you guys are on another planet. It, it's like you, you sort of the... The, the front of the train that I think so many people are, are trying to catch up with. Um, is, is there, um, in your feeling, do you feel like there's a repetition in the quality of work? Do you find that artists just keep finding new stuff to do? Well, okay, first I want to say something about, you had mentioned about other countries, you know, America having volunteer organizations and the envy of other countries. When we were in China, uh, it was new to me to find out they they know nothing about vol. They they were shocked when they found out that NWS was an all volunteer run organization. Nobody gets paid. You know, if we don't get money from the government, it, it <laughs> there's no there. We report to ourselves. Yes, we follow all the rules. But they, how do you do that was the question when we were there. This was in 2015. How do you have a volunteer organization? So, yes. So on that, I'll close that. But I, you're right. That was very interesting to find that out. They don't have that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and the, the, where you went was regarding uh, repetition. Is that what you, is that what the question was? Yeah. How, how with so many exhibitions going on, people that are constantly painting for different competitions and exhibitions, uh, is there a sort of like a static level or are they constantly, are people able to constantly find new subjects, new ways of dealing with a subject, new techniques, new, uh, something new? Well, absolutely. Again, the answer is both because it is amazing with every show you will see Oh my God, look at this still. It's a still life and it's painted completely differently. I mean, you'll see at NWS, every prospectus, every year, you would think that after 103 years, you know, we, we would have like cookie cutter prospectus. Every single year, a prospectus has to be re-engineered to fit what's happening in the watercolor world because Water media artists are constantly trying new things. The um, art store community, they're inventing new products. Water, uh, you know, artists are using them. Next thing you know, it's aqua board. You need to start allowing watercolor on aqua board. Now, you know, varnishing now is quite a big deal where artists are, because they're wanting to be in that oil painting level. You know, there's that, there's that notion that oh watercolor it's not as it's not on the high level as oil paint because it's behind glass or you know it's on paper so now it's like okay really is that what's going on how about this then so now they're <laughs> mounting their paper on aqua board or some kind of panel varnishing it no glass no nothing beautiful frame on the outside whether it's you know and the, and we're entering into shows and showing with what with oil painting shows where there's organizations that have both and they are just as fantastic as the oil painting they're right next to so i think it's uh, you know nws is pretty progressive in terms yeah. of of where we go so i think with nws you see a lot of new ways of using water media that you may not see in a tr more traditional organization or competition. Yeah, I like the way that you use the, the term water media. Um, so what would you would you include in water media then? Well, acrylic. Okay, so when acrylics came out, you had to, you, you couldn't not let let you know you couldn't exclude them because then the argument was yeah but i clean my brushes in water i use water so <laughs> you know so now you you have to include acrylic paint and um you know and then there's collaging and there's work on upo and so um some organizations i think are much more open with their collage and ws if a artist is collaging they have to make all the collage stuff themselves they can't use off the any off the shelf collage material so 
uh, I think as our organization, we, we, we work really hard to service the artists in terms of what they're doing, but also um, stay within the confines of artists creating the work top down, right? Like through every level, they have their hand in it. And so the new, new conversation that goes on behind the scenes and in front of the scenes will be AI and how much of that, you know, it, it's wonderful to be on the board right now because we're talking a lot about AI. Where is that going? How is that impacting artwork? Um, you know, you'll see internationally the disruption that's being caused in museum exhibitions or shows everywhere. Uh, photography is being impacted hugely with AI. So we're, we're paying attention and we're wanting to stay in the conversation and understand how it is going to be used as a tool versus, um, you know, not really the artist, not really being in charge. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, you know, there's that, there's, there's always been that, um, that conversation about technology, people who scan their drawing, um, maybe 10, 15 years ago, people would say, you know, no, 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 that's not good. You have to be able to draw freehand and tracing is, is not, um, is not good. Um, then it evolves and everything just keeps evolving. But as you say, there is a risk that at some point there becomes so much technology and less present, uh, presence of the artist. So then you sort of wonder, you know, is creativity just an, a, an endless field and we should allow any level of creativity, whether it's technology or, um, you know, paintbrushes and, and, um, and paint? And it's a, it's a, you know, we had a conversation a couple of weeks ago on that. And it is a tricky question because we're already seeing, um, you know, this sort of thing in shows. And, and we're not, I don't, or at least when I first saw it, I wasn't prepared. And it's sort of like, okay, so what do we do? Um, you know, where are the limits? Um, they haven't been placed down. Should there be limits? So that's another interesting conversation that I think that we're going to have, um, you know, over time. But watercolour has um, a funny sort of um, environment where we talk about watercolourists and it's very insular. And for watercolourists to go and exhibit in um, a multimedia exhibition, that's brilliant. But here in Europe and also I know in a lot in Australia, it doesn't happen so much. Watercolour stays separate from the other medium. Um, do you think that's a good thing or do you think that it's better to have, um, you know, oil, pastels, acrylic, watercolour all lobbed into a, um, an art exhibition or competition or is there strength by numbers um, in a sense when all watercolours are together, do they push the, each other um, further? Well, you know, I think it really depends, competitions, like competitions that anything can enter, whether it's sculpture, photographs, oil, pastel, you name it, whatever you're doing, you can enter it as long as it's art. Um, I won't enter those. It, if, you know, it's one thing, even if you go to a museum, they usually segregate either by time period or, you know, here's the paintings are over here, sculptures are over here. Um, I think, I think it's a really, it's really tough when you have artists who are creating with their hand, uh, being juried next to artists who are creating with a camera. And now I'm supposed to pick between a photograph and a handmade art object. Personally, you know, myself, I prefer the handmade art object because to me, it's, you know, photography is different and artists use photography to create something else. So I like the separation unless, of course, you know, if it's a museum exhibition or something and it's an invitational and an artist isn't being invited because they want to be included with a plethora of other works. That's a whole other story. But in terms of competition, I don't feel it really serves 
anyone to have these open competitions where you can submit anything. Uh, you know, I guess maybe if it is genre specific, theme specific, if they say, okay, the theme is, you know, the sun rising. Okay. Yeah. And then you open the door to any kind of artwork with the sun rising as a theme, you know, then that would be great. That's a whole nother matter. So, you know, I think people who put on competitions need to really think about what it is that they're doing and why they're doing it, you know, in for for something like that yeah i agree i agree yeah so where do you think can you see um with everything that that you're involved in including obviously your own art can you see a way forward do you see to see an idea of where we're going options that we have new ideas on the horizon oh you, my god <laughs> oh, wait, what was that <laughs> we've got an hour left <laughs> No, but what do you think? What do you think? Because so many people, this is the this is the thing that I hear so often. People say, but what is there left to do? We've already painted everything. Um, the level's so good. What else is there to do? Um, some people really do believe that there is nothing less left to create. There is no way forward. Um, it's just basically moving deck chairs around, just doing things a little bit differently. What do you think? Oh, my God. I think there is so much to do. I think the world is screaming for beautiful, for beauty, actually, and art. And I think artists need to, I mean, here, where, you know, Americans love to go to Europe. Why? Because we go to Europe and you go to these older cities with the old architecture and there's like beautiful architecture, beautiful design, beautiful sculptures beautiful everything and uh you know you come back home and and like here in San Diego there's strip malls there's you know get it up fast don't spend spend as little money as possible there's no design there's no creativity in a roof line or a molding it's all little boxes ticky tacky little boxes and I just think if artists you know they need to just share what they're doing maybe in their community and maybe it's going to be about more community in um involvement and less about me 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 the big artist at the top blue chip artist i i actually think the blue chip artist thing is going away i i think it's going to be about creating individual uh, places where people want to go because they're incredible they're awesome the artwork there is awesome the creativity is fantastic um i i just see there's a lot out there still to do i think the world is screaming for artwork beautiful stuff yeah i think there's a real need for it i think like you say i think people we've been through a hard time the last few years and i think people need um to see things and feel good um, you know, I think when you look at paintings that go into um, the exhibitions, you look at paintings that sell at the moment, you look at paintings that get selected at the moment, and they are paintings that have some sort of, oh, sort of, it touches more the emotion and, and it's a positive effect. You know, I remember in the, in the 80s, 90s, even the, two, the, the, the 2000s, perhaps more the 90s and 2000s, um, there was this desire to shock, the shock and awe sort of, you know, and we'd be getting gruesome. And and we've just moved so far away from that because I think people need um, and they want to feel good. And art has such an amazing um, way of getting to a person without hurting them, without hurting or, or um, shaking them up too much. It's, it's very gentle. Um, Photography is less, I think. I think painting, if you go outside, I mean, I know this, you know this, you, you're a drawer, you're a brilliant drawer, you take your, your pad of paper, you go with a pencil and you can literally stand right in front of someone, I've done this a thousand times, and you just start drawing them. And, and you know, if they look a bit uncomfortable, I just say to them, it's like, don't move. And it's like, <laughs> my line's always the same. Um, it works for anyone who wants to use it, take it. I just keep saying 
all of this stuff around. You're the most perfect thing. Don't move. Just give me five minutes. And I'm like, just turn this way. This is your better side. This one's not so good. Turn on this side. And you've made a friend. Um, you've made people laugh. You've got this personal sort of connection going on. And then things just happen. If you go up to someone and you go, stay there. I love your face. I want to paint it. I want to take a photo. They'll be gone. There is something special um, which open doors um, about art, but particularly drawing and painting. And I agree with you. I think if we can get that into more of the mainstream, um, that would be brilliant for the community. 100% agree on that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we were just in Denver and um, driving past old like mining towns that are not being used anymore, you know, like they're vacant. And I'm looking at these mining towns going, oh my God, these would make incredible art studios. This would be a, like a little community of artists who came there and made all kinds of things. They could have a kiln, they could have a letterpress, they could, you know, I mean, even, you know, we took a trip down the Mississippi River in a uh, paddle boat and we went off into all these little communities that are like ghost towns because all the young people have left and gone into the big cities. But these little towns, they still have that flavor of uniqueness. And they're begging for people to come, for artists to come in and just bring back a cafe, a, a little restaurant, a place where you can go in and do sculpture, do clay, do paint, do water. I, you know, it's just... I think more and more people, maybe maybe they'll get a little bit disheartened with the big city life or something and find that these little communities and creating an art business and, and teaching people art and just glass work. I mean, all of that stuff, all of the things that make living in a place so worthwhile. I'm hoping that it comes back. And it, it does start with drawing. It starts with black and white. It starts with pen or pencil on paper. And you just go from there. Next thing you know, you go, you find out, oh, you know what? I want to bend metal. You know, I mean, it really, it just, you don't know where it's going to take you. But, okay, you did mention something. Everybody started their art training at five years old. That is so true. And, <laughs> and since everybody is inside, there's this little artist in there begging to come out. I, I think um, water, color, water media, competent, any, anything that can get them inspired to get going. I'm a firm believer in that. Education yeah. is, of course, huge, you know, and, and I know NWS, we work hard at providing education, setting up. Uh, we started something called the Skull Art Ship, and that is an, um, an artist volunteers to donate whatever they want of their time. It could be a portfolio a review, a conversation, a workshop, art instruction, whatever it is that that artist wants to donate. And a, a single artist is then chosen to who, who just says they they want to have a skull art ship to work with that individual because it's the one on one that I think that is really, really lacking and important. And I think that makes a big difference just to get that conversation going. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I grew up um, in Australia and when I was about 12, I mean, exactly what you just said. I started pencil on paper, just exactly like you said. All of a sudden, one day, but by this time I was 19, I thought, oh, colour. Never thought about colour before. So, you know, you start with something and it evolves. And then all of a sudden, because Australia is a hot country, there's a lot of, there were a lot of watercolourists at the time um, that were around. I um, was lucky enough to be surrounded by most of the world's best, a lot of the world's best watercolors at that time, so in the 80s. And one of them took me very much under his wing. Um, I contacted him a few times. I asked him for, for you know, just for some comments and some help, and that was Bob Wade. Um, Bob Wade, I think, I, I, I don't know there's too many watercolorists out there that don't remember Bob, Bob Wade's contribution to watercolor. Um, and that just changes everything. 
Um, and I think artists often feel competition or they don't want to share what they're doing at the moment because they don't want someone else to be going down that track. And a lot of artists sort of um, will hold off from sharing, yet from what I know is that the more we talk about it, um, the more everyone is more inspired, so the more you actually gain. But how do you bring, because I think us, the older guys in this, we sort of understand that, but how do you get the new younger generation, which has nothing to do with art anymore in schools, how do you get them into this movement? Well, I think that is the question of the day, right, um, is how how do you get them off of the screen and into reality, <laughs> you know, yeah. and uh, it could be it could be that you have to go into schools or uh, there's a I see a lot of organizations, they start mentorships, there's young, they have programs specifically designed for young people. Um, maybe you have people who can go into the schools and and uh start introducing it um afternoon classes i think i think you try as many ideas as absolutely possible you know to get that going on i, I have a feeling that 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 this screen thing is going to evolve into such an empty place anyway that they if you're a creator, if you are in, want to create, you can't stuff that in a bottle for too long. You know, you're going, you're going to want to have that come out. And I, I think it's dialoguing, conversations, inviting young people to, to join a conversation about like, uh, what would it take for you to enter this show or to start making art or to put pen, pen to paper, pencil to paper, you know? Um, I know one thing, having juried a lot, talking to artists that when they don't, a lot of artists get discouraged, uh, if they don't get into shows all the time, right? Like you meet that all the time. And then I'm never going to enter another show ever again. And I always say to those artists, then, you know, it's a numbers game. There's a boatload of shows to enter, enter more shows, enter as many shows as you can get involved behind the scenes and see what's going on. That is a great way to learn about uh, how, it, how the sausage is made, you know, because you'll see uh, like NWS, we have three jurors of selection for the international. You could take all of those pieces of art, that whole, everything they juried and give it to three other completely different artists and you'll have a completely different exhibition. That's, you know, on one hand, there, there are a list of things we all look for. On the other hand, there's subjectivity. And what may grab you doesn't grab me, and what grabs me might not grab the next person. So, um, yeah, maybe it's about that sharing thing, getting the ego a little bit nested in so it's not so, you know, <laughs> Uh, my work's good enough. I should be getting in. Why am I not getting in? I'm not going to enter anymore. You know, I mean, there's all that. There's the personal conversation too that has to be dealt with. Yeah. yeah. But I think that's that's part of the hard learning curve because you have to constantly bring your art back to you. Your, your art's not about um, if someone else says it's good, if someone else wants to buy you. you you're injecting you into your art, but at the same time, you're wanting almost to, to create some sort of a, uh, I call it a conversation, if you like, where you're expressing something and then people are giving you something back. So it's really emotional. So if your painting's not selected, just like you said before, because perhaps they already have enough, it's not because your, your painting's bad, people will automatically be hurt because their heart and soul's being put on that piece of paper. So it's such a heavy rejection. But I think we constantly have to go back to ourselves and sort of say, okay, so I wasn't selected, why? And then you look at your painting, you look at those that are selected and you try and understand why. You try and understand maybe it was my subject. They already had 10 paintings of street scenes. They didn't need another one. Um, you know, maybe they had, you know, you know, enough 
of, of whatever, a different subject, different style of painting. Um, so I think we take things too much to heart and sometimes don't think a little bit as objectively as we could, which is where we'll learn because that's that's where you learn. Okay, so if I do things exactly like you said in the beginning, if I take my subject and if there's two artists that there's, they're going to be choosing between two artists, how can I make my painting just a little bit more interesting than the other guy? And, and that's another um, branch of creativity. It's not yeah. just creativity on the paper, but how do you as an artist um, get seen over the next door neighbour? Um, what, what are you What are you doing? And that's also a hard one. I remember because we were in China sort of around the same time in 2015. That was a boom era. China, you know, yeah, there was. was so much stuff going on. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. And I gave um, a couple of workshops, a couple of big um, conferences, um, which was basically on how the Chinese artists could get their work into Europe or America, um, what the European and American public were looking for so that these paintings would be selected or sold. Um, and, and it was constantly the question of how do I paint to please them? And I'm like, you have to go back to you first. And that was a hard one for a lot of the Chinese because they're not used to having them as the centrepiece. Yeah. And and I re that really um, struck a chord with me because it really made me understand, you know, yeah, we paint and we present for a public, um, but you as a person has to have to evolve because as you evolve, your art will evolve. And if it's seer, it will work really well. If it's copying, you're trying to look like this, you're trying to be like that person, it never works so well. So you have to sort of go down exactly like you said before, know what you want. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it is funny, you know, with uh, artists, are, we're a crazy lot because first, you know, we enter a show, we want to get in. And OK, so then we get the notice, we get in, we're like, oh, awesome. OK, great. And then you find out, well, you didn't get an award. Well, why didn't I get an award? You know, so <laughs> so then it's like, or maybe you didn't get first place. Maybe you got an award, but it wasn't a top award. Well, why didn't I get the top of my, a top award? Or then you go see the show and your painting is hung next to the bathroom or something. And then you go, oh my God, you know, look at where they hung my painting. It's not even in a very good place. I mean, you know, it's like the, the disappointment of something never ends. And then, oh, geez, it, nobody even bought my painting. It was for sale and nobody bought it. You know, it's hysterical, right? You got to laugh at it for sure. But um, yeah, the, 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 that, the whole reason, like if you're painting a still life, are you just copying what's out there? I mean, why is it you're the one who picked it? You picked whatever it is the subject is. You picked everything about it. And yet you're not going to tell me why you picked it. You know, I'm not going to have a clue in that painting about why that was interesting to you. You know, like, I think you have to have that element. Even if you're a photorealist, you have to be able to give the viewer something about why this was special to you. And, um, you know, I sometimes I think that's missing because many artists were so busy trying to like nail the subject we forget about adding that little extra thing about why I why that was special to me. And that that's that little kick that you're talking about, I think. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah. Now, that leads me to another question that I wanted to ask you, because everything that you do, everything that you've said so far, um, rotate, rotates around other people. Um, whether it be organizations, um, you know, volunteer work, how important that is, growing the person, your own idea. Okay. So you your is it would it be right to say your favorite subject is painting people? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it would it would be right to say that. I am a figure painter. I love painting the human body. Uh, I love I I paint the human figure a lot of times nude. Why is that? Because I don't want to date them. 
And if I put clothes on someone, they're dated in a period. And yeah. if I paint the birthday suit, they are, they will always be period less, you know, it will, the birthday suit is the birthday suit, no matter, no matter what. And, um, I, I find there's so much expression and em emotion in the whole figure. I don't like to cover it up with a lot of clothing or fabric or whatever. Although that means, um, will my work be accepted into many shows? Po most likely not, because many shows, especially in this country, they don't include nudes. Okay, so in Europe, I, I don't think it's such a big deal over there. I mean, you got nudes in the middle of a street, you know, you got all kinds of nude sculptures hanging everywhere. So um, I, I don't think anything that I personally paint is untasteful. But, you know, hey, one time I have a big oil painting of, of pot smokers. They're clothed, you know, but like they're smoking a joint. And there's smoke everywhere. And I think it's a fantastic oil painting, but it didn't get picked for a show. This was some years ago because it wasn't family friendly. Now that's really interesting because in California, you know, this all, this is like drug pot haven here. You can smoke all day long if you want, you know, and you can buy it anywhere. So like attitudes shift and change and, um, I think people need to paint what's in their heart no matter what. I agree with you on that. Whether you get into shows or you don't get into shows, if you're not painting what's on your heart and in your heart, you're not, you know, and you're just painting to get into shows or to sell work, at a, at a certain point, you're going to run out of steam on that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're you going to hit the wall. Yeah. You lose the magic. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. That's a hundred percent. Yeah. So then how do how does I mean where's that fine line? Because you know, if you become an X-rated um censored artist and you're not allowed to exhibit in all the shows that you want to because they're not family friendly subjects, mind you, your nudes are perfect, aren't they? Not they're not um uh they're not upsetting at all. I mean it, it's it sounds silly. Um, but then what yeah. about these artists that have to live on the sales? That's where choosing your subject so that it does get you into the exhibitions or the competitions and can get you the sales. Where's that fine line between me, I'm being me, the artist, I'm painting what I want, how I want, and I don't want to eat potatoes every week for another month? I think that is such a great question because art history is loaded with that question, answers to that question. First artist that comes to mind is John Singer Sargent. I mean, he he painted all of those portraits of for all the rich, fancy people, and that's where what his bread and butter. What did he really love to paint? Watercolor out in nature. Like, <laughs> you know, and then at, towards after he achieved so much success, pretty soon he said, that's it. I'm done doing all these highfalutin people. I'll just do your sketch because they still wanted him to be to paint them. But he's like, no, I'm just going to do a sketch of you. And he did it, all these charcoal drawings. And that's and that was what he did. But so I think artists, you know, one. Lowering your want list is huge. Like not having so many things that you have to have in order to live will really help an artist get by with less being able to do what they want to do. Do you have the newest car? No. Do you eat at the best restaurants? No, probably not. Do you live simply? Yeah. You know, because you want to spend your money on art supplies and being able to have time to make art. So then the other thing would be have a job doing what you love. If if what you love, if you could handle being a barista, if that works, then do that. You know, like it, whatever you need to do so that you can still satisfy that inner artist, I think is really key. And if that means making paintings like, OK, I do a lot of landscape paintings, too. I like painting outside. I think it informs my color world in nature. I think it's important. I do little, little landscape paintings. I love doing that. 
you know, I just think there's ways to still do, I mean, okay, you know, is it important to me to sell my, uh, my figurative work that I do that I really dump a lot of messaging, meaning, I do a ton of research, all of that? No, but I'll paint a bunch of other things that I would hope would sell that have nothing to do with that. So I think that an artist can be very flexible with their output, you know, in terms of what they make and what can sell versus what doesn't sell. Um, that that doesn't sacrifice who they are, you yeah. know, it, it, and it still pays the bills. You know, I think there's ways to handle that. You just got to open the door, open the windows more to let those ideas come in and those, uh, you know, opportunities happen. Talk to people, go to places, be involved, getting involved in an organization, volunteering. Volunteering opens a ton of doors for people. And I, I think that's something that n younger artists who are just involved in screens, maybe they don't know enough yet. I, that could be the fault of organizations not selling how important volunteering is because you get relationships. The yeah. relationships that come with volunteering are phenomenal and they cost you nothing. You just sign up and you be, you show up, right? You just show up and say, hey, I'll help you do X. I'm really good at this. You need some help with X. I'm good at doing that. So um, I, I think in terms of an organization or any organization, we could do better by talking about all the positive things that come with volunteering and being a part of something larger, something bigger than just me, my little Instagram page or whatever, you know, my influencer, this or that. You know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But I mean that's that's us. I, I can imagine the 16, 17, 20 year old saying, what? What? Volunteer my time for free? What? So yeah, right. there's gonna have well, to be a yeah, there's going to have to be a reason why they come in, but yeah. Well, sometimes yeah, the reason is on their college application. Did you, you know, do you do community service? Like, like, you know, actually come to think of it, you know, that is a big part of any person's CV, right? When you look mm -hmm. at a biography or you look at a CV, I don't care what your age is. Does it show that you give back? You know, because, because, there's monetary give back, there's time give back, there's talent give back. There's many ways to be of service to the, you know, your neighborhood, your community, the larger world, whatever that pond is that you're in. And I think it's something I hope America doesn't lose as we move further and further into this technology world, you know, because you're right about saying it is a unique part of the American spirit. And I I think it's always been here from the inception. And I hope it is not something we lose because it is very, very special. Mm. Well, we're, we're touching on the core of humanity, aren't we? It's yes. The, it's the collective. Yeah. yeah. And I think that we're focused for, for too long on individual gain, individual um, uh, satisfaction, um, whatever we get back from it. Uh, and I think a lot of people know that at some point that becomes empty. And, yeah. and going back to, you know, how can I help? Um, what can I do is, you know, can I be part of something is probably the biggest driver of progression that we could we could find individually and collectively um so what about what about you who've got loads of ideas um what about this idea of america's over there um australia's down there europe's over there how do we cross bridges more because today basically what's going on is that people basically just put their images on the internet you get likes for them is there a way of in increasing um, the flow or the ease of one artist exhibiting in one country 
Um, and another one, I know that we did do that around 2015. I know that, you know, we were doing the big international shows. I know that there was positive effects and negative effects. Um, for me personally, I don't know how many paintings I lost, um, you know, sending paintings to one place and another place, then they'd get shipped there, then they'd get shipped there, and then I just lost um, track of them. Um, but the experience was invaluable. Um, the relations were invaluable. Um, and it seems like the heaviness of COVID, um, you know, people started staying at home. Now they're starting to work on the internet. Now we're doing everything on the internet and we're moving in that sort of solitary direction less in the collective physical exhibition, the, you know, the things that we can actually learn from one culture. You've been to China, you've been to loads of different countries. When you're actually there with your feet on the ground, it's very different than just looking at um, a few images or getting a little bit of feedback. So is there a way that we can sort of expand on um, crossing the bridge of, of, of oceans to actually get American painters into Europe, say Europe, European painters into Australia and sort of, because it's a different identity. You know, Americans paint in a certain way. It's interesting for the Europeans to see it. The um, Europeans paint in a different way. It's interesting for the Australians. Do you have any ideas on that? Well, you know, one thing that NWS has done, we do these uh, international, these exchanges, international exchanges. So one exchange happened in 2015. It was with China and it was in Shenzhen. It was small image. So uh, the one we're working on right now is, is an exchange um, reciprocal with Scotland, with the Royal Scottish Watercolor Society. So they had, they sent 40 of their small image pieces to NWS. It was before COVID. And then we were supposed to send 40 of ours over there. Well, we're just now, because of COVID, everything got shut down. So we're just now doing that. And, and we're having, we're doing it online and we're sending 40 of those pieces that were chosen will go to Scotland. And the, it, it does make for a really nice cultural exchange. So, uh, and I think doing more of those would be really beneficial. Doing them where you're not having to deal with framework, you know, shipping now and taxes and all of that. You start to get into minutia of country issues in terms of how different countries' rules are and how you have to navigate that. Um, I think you, small works doing exchanges using small works where they can all be bundled in one package they're not framed the place that gets them deals with presentation uh, makes it a, a doable thing the internet of course having conversations back and forth different societies being able to have platforms where they can talk uh, and answer questions i mean that would be another great way um i think I think exhibitions of like, you know, even if they're just online and then being able to talk about them or the difference, you know, and maybe more theme shows to really show how how one country addresses a specific, you know, a theme in one country, it's completely different than the way another country sees it. You know, that could be another really interesting thing to do. There's so many ideas out there. I know you have a boatload of ideas. I you know, I could talk to my board, they would have a boatload of ideas, I have ideas. I think it's the people, it's the feet on the ground, you know, because <laughs> every idea comes with a boatload of people you're going to need to follow through on it. So it's a matter of picking the best one at the time and then finding people who can get behind it to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, th I think you're right saying one of the biggest factors is that factor of communication that sharing, actually talking about it, not just looking about the painting, talking about the experience, even if it's online, but it, there's still that stimulation and conversation between artists and professional artists to amateur artists to, to sort of help people um, develop. Well, mm -hmm. in, in Denver, where we were teaching a jury to show and teaching a workshop, it's the Rocky Mountain Show, 
I was able to have a fantastic conversation with the director of their 501c3. So I don't know how it works in Europe with nonprofits. Do you have that kind of thing there? Nonprofit organizations? Yeah. Yeah. You do. So, you know, at nonprofit art organizations, it's good if the if the people behind the scenes can come together as well and talk and share about how they're doing something and exchange ideas so that nobody's reinventing the wheel. They're okay. They're just taking, okay, you do it that way. That would work for us. We just need to massage it in a little bit different way in order for that to make it happen. But, you know, those are important conversations too, that the organizers to be able to communicate with one another. I know she was very happy to know about how we did some things, how juring works for art organizations versus theirs, different programs that work that we may want to try. I think those are the kind of things that are really important and can knit organizations closer together, you know, to, to be more unified. And like you said, not even organizations will tend to do that me, me, me thing, right? Where it's just us, you know, it's all about us. We're just doing us. We're just doing. And I think that has to fall aside and the sharing needs to take place more and more between organizations, you know, especially NWS owning its own building. We, the, we, I see opportunity on the horizon that, you know, is just fantastic. So, you know, I'm going, I'm retiring this year. This is the end of my term as president. So I'll be passing the baton in January to a new president and a new board. And, you know, I'm excited for them. I'm doing my best to create a, a, a strong foundation to pass on so that they can keep going with the momentum we've been creating since COVID. And, you know, and I think every organization after COVID is having to reinvent itself. Yeah, I mean, that was really disruptive. Yeah, but that's that's also where it's a time for artists because when you're in a situation which is complicated, um, when we don't know what to do, there is nothing better than um, the people who have inspiration, that are creative, that have initiative to find new ideas. Um, so it's such a good time for creation and it's such a good time for people to come back to what is it that I want? Okay, for a certain amount of time, I've lived in a way that wasn't necessarily for me. But now, what is it that I want? How can we move forward? Where's the creativity coming from? And where are we going? And so I think that, like you say, creativity, change, and all the opportunities that we can imagine are just on the horizon. And we, we, we're just ready to sort of say, yeah. okay, let's go. Yeah, 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 let's go. Let, let's yeah. let's get it going on. Let's let's get things so exciting that young people want to uh, be a part of the movement, you know. Um, so I think it's it's like maybe opening the door to not being so restrictive with some rules about making art. And then maybe that has to do with opening up other kinds of exhibitions that uh, you, you know, anything goes kind of a thing. Maybe these things where they're just online, you know, you're using, somebody's using water media in a totally un, unorthodox way, you know, like, let's find out about it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So I think that we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. So, but is there something that you want to add? Is there something that you want to talk about that we haven't touched on? Uh, I, boy, I can't think of it. I think we touched on a lot. So um, I, I hope it, it, uh, people would find it interesting what we talked about. I think it's, I think that you and I both agree there's a lot more that is possible and yet wait, bubbling up, waiting to evolve. And I don't see the uh, dire straits at all. I, I just, um, I see that people are just, aching to get their creativity going it's almost like they're looking for permission it's something that we and we found out at this workshop so many people are dealing with timidness and i think you know that 
that has to be dealt with head on, like, like build that internal fortitude of courage that it outweighs, it just blasts through that whole timid thing, you know, where success and failure, it doesn't matter. It's the fact that you are putting yourself out there to be successful or fail. People maybe aren't reading enough about how how things happen, you know, how many light bulbs Benjamin had to do in order to discover electricity, you know, all of that stuff, like, like, that's what it's about. So um, yeah, the timid thing is pretty big. And uh, building that backbone of courage, I think art really can do that. And having conversations one on one organizations talking. Yeah, it's all it's all good. Fabulous. All right. It's always lovely talking to you. I love, I always come out with a smile. I'll end up with sore muscles in my cheek from smiling so much. So. Well, this has been fun. And I hope, you know, you and I will have to get together behind the scenes and see what other kind of ideas we can generate and, and get moving on and um, see if we can get people enlisted in those and, uh, you know, make some more stuff happen. Mix it up a little bit. Yeah, all it takes is just to start. It, it, yeah. There's nothing scary. You just have to go with it. And things develop. Things will happen. So yeah. there's no worries. There's no worries to be had. Yeah. No, that's right. right. Well, thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> okay, um, well, thank you, Janine. All right. So we'll wrap it up. I hope you all enjoyed Stephanie. I always do. Um, link her paintings up on her website. Um, she's so prolific. Um, I don't think there's anyone as prolific as you, particularly in the watercolor <laughs> scene. So, oh come on, well there's there's a lot of prolific artists out there. You know, I mean, I can yeah, they're wrong. But you you have you do every single technique there is. I mean, there isn't one technique left that you don't do. Well, you know, uh, if the art store is your candy store, which it is for me, um, you know, you just can't not try, oh, my God, you know, I have to try this and I have to try that. I, it's just um, if you and I love texture and I love um, how things feel. I want to feel it. I want to touch it, you know, and a lot of my watercolor is inspired by my oil painting because I'm, I'm kind of a oil painter at heart, but oil painting has a lot, can have a lot of texture. And I, I unfortunately have a hard time would sign up. I have a, would have a hard time signing up to be a traditional watercolorist with transparent watercolorist because I I can't I want to feel the paint. <laughs> yeah. And um yeah, but I love I love all kinds of watercolor. You know, if it's beautiful and fantastic and and unique and and uh progressive, you know, something new out there, it's just so exciting to look at it and be inspired and go, how did they do that? Right? Yeah. yeah it's yeah. such a mystery. Yeah. That you've got someone who's coming in and out of the background just behind <laughs> you. Maybe Ken can can come forward. It's almost like this is your life. Ken Goldman. Yeah, that's right. Forward. Let's see. I'll move aside. See if he there can. He is. There he is. I thought I was so, far enough back. <laughs> yeah, you disappear. You disappear into paradise behind you. So well, Ken is obviously another brilliant artist. But one of the most favourite paintings that I have, I mean, you've got loads as well, Ken, that I love, is actually a painting that you painted of Stephanie um, painting at the easel. You've got yeah. it on your website and it's just so perfect because Stephanie's 100% in her painting. You've captured the moment and it's like the artist capturing the artist and you kind of think, okay, so what else do we need to say? There, there's nothing else. So it's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was a pretty, pretty good one. A lot of people are like, how did he, where, well, how was this all done? And there, you know, I was painting a self portrait and there were so many mirrors around. <laughs> so that, yeah, that it was looks, great. It, it's exactly you as well. That's what's so perfect about it. It's, it's sort of suggested it's not overworked, but it's just you and it's so simple. 
It's straight to the point, simple, but strong. It's one of those things that you don't always get. Unfortunately, it's an oil painting, so I can't ever enter it into a watercolor show. They're boring. Oh, well. Yeah. So let me just say something about my background. The, the background is Ocean Beach, and we have a pier there. I'm, I took the picture from the end of the pier. It's one of the longest piers in California, actually. And I gotta uh, get out. Of and it, you know, we thought for a, there was a really big storm, a huge waves that came and, and uh, busted out large parts of the pier. And for a while, the city was saying, oh, it's got to, it's going to have to be destroyed. It's t- cost too much to fix it. We're going to have to take it down, blah, blah, blah. And it was really, really, it was closed for a long time. And they have since fixed it and reopened it. And I'm, you know, it's so exciting because it's one of the walks we love to go on because people fish out there. It's just, it's just gorgeous because it is so long and beautiful. Anyway, that's, that's my background is uh, Ocean Beach (laughs) and the pier. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Sounds like a beautiful place. Yeah. It looks like a beautiful place because we can see it. It is. And if you ever come to San Diego, we'll go out there and take you out there to the Ocean Beach Pier. Yeah. Would love to. We'll all go out and paint. Yeah. Oh my God. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. I'm going to have to let you go. I have to all go right. dinner. <laughs> Thank See you so much, Janine. Really You're great welcome. conversation. Yeah. Bye. All right. All right. I'll speak I'll to you both soon. Okay. 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 Bye. Bye.